Mexico, from the Olmecs to the Aztecs, by Dr. Michael Coe and Rex Kuntz. Chapter 6, The Classic Period, Rise of the Great Civilizations. By any criteria, the period from about AD 150 to 650 was the most remarkable in the whole development of ancient Mexico. This era of fluorescence is called the Classic, and it is at this time that the peoples of Mexico built civilizations that can bear comparison with those of other parts of the globe. With justification, the Classic is thought of as the Golden Age, when the seeds that were planted during the pre classic period reached their fruition. The Classic Era begins at other times in other areas of Mesoamerica. The Classic span is given most, in most books as AD 250 to 900, based upon the period during which the lowland Maya were inscribing long count dates on their stone monuments. However, Central Mexico began the Classic in the 2nd century AD and possibly even earlier, when urban construction began at the great city of Teotihuacan. And if Teotihuacan itself had fallen into ruins long before the last classic Maya city was abandoned. By the classic period, literacy may have been pan-Mesoamerican, although perhaps only the Maya and to a lesser extent the Zapotecs had fully developed hieroglyphic scripts, that is, writing systems which recorded the spoken language. Although no books have survived from the classic into our day, we have every reason to believe that many peoples possessed them. Dates were generally recorded in terms of the 52-year calendar round, but in the Gulf Coast, the long count was used. What for, if not to write their own history? From their genesis in the Olmec periods, the gods of Mexico had finally revealed themselves in all their bewildering variety. There had now crystallized a, c a complete pantheon, one that was shared by all Mexicans, and probably in somewhat altered form, even by the Maya. The most ubiquitous of these deities were the rain god, perhaps metamorphosed from one of the Olmec were jaguars. His consort, the water goddess, a creator divinity, viewed as an aged fire god or as an old man and an old woman, the sun god, the moon goddess, and the feathered serpent, known to the later Aztecs as Quetzalcoatl. On the basis of older and now outdated notions about what the classic Maya were supposed to be like, it used to be thought that the classic throughout Mesoamerica was a time of general peace and tranquility without the obsession with warfare and human sacrifice considered typical of the post-classic. That idea is probably a delusion stemming from the fact that we have a tremendous amount of post-conquest documentation on the late peoples of Mexico, and none at all on the classic. It is true that not many fortified sites are known from the classic, but it should be stressed that all temple clusters and compounds in Mesoamerica were defensible, and that many peoples of this era were careful to place their civic ceremonial centers on hilltops. In reality, there has ne never been a people who did not indulge in warfare, including the classic Maya. In this connection, the sudden spread of the art styles and products of some classic civilizations has quite justly been interpreted as a result of conquest. Furthermore, in at least one area, the Gulf Coast, human sacrifice was probably as common as it was among the later Aztecs. There must have been many more people in Mexico during the Classic than formerly. Ruins are everywhere in central and southeastern Mexico, and most of them are classic. In the Valley of Mexico alone, the monumental survey carried out by William Sanders and his associates has shown that by the end of the early Classic, there were 40 times as many inhabitants of the area than in the middle pre-classic. On the basis of a technology that was essentially Neolithic, for metals were unknown until after AD 800, the Mexicans raised fantastic numbers of buildings, decorated them with beautiful polychrome murals, produced pottery and figures in unbelievable quantity, and covered everything with sculptures. Even mass production was introduced with the invention of the clay model for making figurines and incense burners. Behind this abundance was the same economic theme that had been emphasized by their predecessors. Simple farming of maize, beans, squash, and chili peppers reflected in the continued importance of nature gods in their pantheon. Some authors have claimed that, that the classic achievement could only have resulted from utilization of some form of irrigation, but this was the primary importance only in the, in the drier regions of Mexico, such as the, the Tehuacan Valley and the Valley of Oaxaca. Very early, the classic fl fl fluorescence 
saw the intensification of sharp social cleavages throughout Mexico and the consolidation of the elite classes. It was long assumed that on a priori grounds that the mode of government was theocratic, with a priestly group exercising temporal power. Evidence from both the imagery and archaeology at Teotihuacan indicate a more complex picture, with warriors also playing key roles. Below these groups that held the, pol the political reins was a peasantry which had hardly changed an iota from pre-classic times. Apart from the post-conquest introduction of animal husbandry and steel tools, the old village farming way of life has hardly been altered until today. How extensive was the, sw the sway of each state over surrounding territory may never be known. We have this kind of information only for the fully literate Maya. It is probable that the most administrative centers held less land and directed far fewer people than the great urban state that then had its capital in the Valley of Mexico. For the classic period, Teotihuacan had no rival in the extent of its influence or the intensity of its contacts with the rest of Mesoamerica. Only in the post-classic Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan would rival the size and reach of the great classic city, the urban civilization of Teotihuacan. Planned cities of the order of those in the Old World were rare anywhere in the Mesoamerican classic. Of the few that did exist, the greatest of all was ancient Teotihuacan, the most important site in the whole of M Mexico. Even Moctezuma Xocoyotzin himself made frequent pilgrimages on foot to its ruins during late Aztec times. Memories of its greatness persisted in Aztec myths recorded after the conquest, for it was then thought that the civilization that had begun at Tamuanchan had been transferred to Teotihuacan. There, the gods met to decide who was to sacrifice himself so as to become the new, the fifth, sun and bring light again to the world. Even though it was night, even though it was not day, even though there was no light, they gathered, the gods convened, there in Teotihuacan. The most humble of them all, Nanahuatzin, the purulent one, cast himself into the flames and became the sun. But the heavenly bodies did not move, so all the gods sacrificed themselves for mankind. For finally, government was established there. The lords of Teotihuacan were wise men, knowers of occult things, possessors of the traditions. When they died, pyramids were built above them. The largest of the pyramids, those of the sun and moon, were said by tradition to have been built by the giants which existed in those days. The Teotihuacan Valley is actually a side pocket of the Valley of Mexico, comprising about 190 square miles known of bottom land lying to the northeast of the valley proper and surrounded by hills. Of this, about one half is suitable for farming. Springs produce copious water that could have been used by the Teotihuacanos for farming, and there is some evidence for irrigation. These natural resources do not explain, however, the movement of most cultivators from throughout the valley of Mexico to Teotihuacan between 150 BC and AD 200. For this, we must turn to evidence from the city itself. The detailed mapping project carried out by Rene Milan of the University of Rochester gives an idea of the gigantic size of this metropolis, the largest city of the pre-Columbian New World. It covered over eight square miles and was fully urbanized. Teotihuacan was laid out shortly after the time of Christ on a grid plan that is consistently oriented to 15 degrees 25 minutes east of true north, arguing that the planners must have been sophisticated surveyors as well. Various astronomical explanations have been advanced for this alignment, none of them completely convincing. Perhaps the strangest fact regarding this great city plan is that there is absolutely no precedent for anywhere for it anywhere in the New World. Teotihuacan's major axis is the Avenue of the Dead, which used to be thought to end at the so-called Ciudadela in the south, a distance of two miles from its northern terminus at the Pyramid of the Moon. It is now known that the avenue is twice this length and that it bisected in front of the Ciudadela by an east-west avenue of equal length so that the city, much like the later Aztec capital, was laid out in quarters. Everything built at Teotihuacan confirmed to the orientation of the main axis. 
The three monumental structures that anchored these sacred ways, and indeed all of Teotihuacan, are the Pyramids of the Sun and of the Moon and the Temple of Quetzalcoatl, the latter the centerpiece of the huge Ciudad de la Complex. The Great Pyramids The Pyramids of the Sun and of the Moon are explicitly named in old legends, and there is no reason to doubt that they were dedicated to those divinities. The former lies to the east of the Avenue of the Dead and not far from it. Its sides, 700 feet long and about 200 feet high, its towers above the surrounding mounds and other ruins. Within it, at the base, are the remains of an earlier pyramid, almost as large as the final version. The Pyramid of the Sun was raised in stages during the Zakwali phase at the site, near the close of the, of the late Pre-Classic. The interior is formed entirely of more than 41 million cubic feet of sun-dried brick and rubble. A stone stairway, in part bifurcated, led to a now destroyed temple on its lofty summit. The Pyramid of the Moon, which contained six earlier versions inside its massive bulk, was broadly similar, although smaller, and was built during the next phase, Mikaoti, at the beginning of the Classic. Both structures attest to the immense power of the early Teotihuacan hierarchy to call up corvée labor from the villages of the territory over which it ruled. It has been pointed out that in the absence of such advanced technology, a powerful state must rely on the work of such human ants. Discovered by accident in 1971, an extraordinary cave underneath the Pyramid of the Sun throws light on why the pyramid was constructed and perhaps even on why Teotihuacan itself was built where it was. The cave is actually a natural lava tube, enlarged and elaborated in ancient times. It runs 330 feet in an easterly direction 20 feet beneath the pyramid, in from the stairway on its main axis, reaching a multi-chambered terminus shaped something like a four-leaf clover. It will be recalled that Aztec tradition placed the creation of the sun and moon, and even the present universe, at Teotihuacan. The ancient news of the caves predates the pyramid, and it re remained as a cult center after its construction. Unfortunately, official excavations carry out, carried out in it were never published, but scholars such as Doris Hayden and Rene Millen note that in pre-conquest Mexico, such caverns were symbolic wombs from which gods like the sun and the moon and the ancestors of mankind emerged in the mythological past. While there is no spring within the cave, there were U-shaped drains that certainly channeled water into the interior of the cave. This immensely holy spot was eventually looted of its contents and sealed off, but the memory of its location may have persisted into Aztec times. The Pyramid of the Moon contained no such cave or other outstanding feature in its interior. It does, however, echo the form of the sacred Cerro Gordo, the major mountain to the north, it may have been conceived by the Teotihuacanos as a replica of that natural feature. Recent work by Ruben Cabrera Castro and, Sab and Sabro Sigyama has detailed six previous const constructions and three dedicatory offerings in the interior of the Moon Pyramid. The building began as a small platform in the last century BC, but by the completion of the Pyramid of the Sun 200 years earlier, the Moon was also a monumental pyramid structure. To inaugurate this monumental phase, a sacrificial offering of felines, eagles, finely carved obsidian and greenstone, and one human victim was laid in, into the foundation. It is only at this point that the building was brought into line with what was to become the orientation of the city. The building was enlarged three more times, with two of these construction episodes marked by elaborate offerings and sacrifices. In the vicinity, a monumental statue of a female deity was found. It may be that the pyramid was actually dedicated to the moon deity, who was often considered female in Mesoamerica. The third building is the triumvirate of Teotihuacan architecture. The Temple of Quetzalcoatl is considerably smaller than the two monumental pyramids discussed above. What it lacks in size, however, it makes up for with its central location, lavish offerings, offerings, and the wealth and importance of its facade decoration. The structure is a seven-tiered step pyramid with typical talud tablero facades located within the Ciudadela at the very heart of the city, 
where the two main axes cross. The Temple of Quetzalcoatl was the last monumental public structure built at Teotihuacan, completed early in the 3rd century AD. Around the tiers of Talutableros, feathered serpents carried mosaic headdresses fashioned after another Ophidian. Elsewhere at Teotihuacan, this headdress is shown on warriors and was probably specific to that office. Effigy seashells are sculpted in the background, suggesting that the scene is taking place in a watery environment. A legend from the Maya Highlands suggests that we have here another version of the first moment of creation, with an opposed pair of serpents, one representing life, greenness, and peace, and the other heat, the desert regions, and war, cavorting or conversing in the primal ocean. Excavations within and around the Quetzalcoatl Pyramid by Ruben Cabrera Castro, Saburo Sugiyama, and George Calgill reveal that it had been built in a single episode during which more than 200 individuals had been sacrificed in elaborate dedicatory rites. Young warriors with their hands tied behind their backs had been dispatched in two groups of 18 individuals, each group being interred in a large burial pit on the north and south sides of the pyramid. Other pits near these contain a smaller number of young females. More sacrificed warriors were interred on the east-west axis of the building. Investigations made in 1925 had shown that, in addition to this great slaughter, a single slain captive had been placed at each of the pyramid's four corners. In the center of the pyramid is, was the richest offering of all, with 20 victims and thousands of pieces of jade, shell, and other materials. By using sacred numbers like 18 and 20, and by placing these offerings in each of the major world di directions, the Teotihuacanos were mirroring the symbolism of Mesoamerican creation epics. The exact mode of sacrificial death has not yet been est established, but in the absence of obvious signs of violence on the bones, strangulation, or poisoning, it seems likely. The grim nature of this mass act unique thus far in the archaeology of any Mesoamerican group, including the Aztecs, is highlighted by the Makapur ne necklaces that many of the victims wear. Strings of human jaws, upper and lower, sometimes real, sometimes crafted from shell. The warrior was celebrated throughout the building, on the facade with the headdress of the office, as well as the interior through the identity of the sacrificial victims. This episode in the life of Teotihuacan is sure testimony that the classic was definitely not a time of peace. One of the more intriguing bits of evidence uncovered by the archaeologists was the evidence of looting by the Teotihuacanos themselves. Two burial pits near the center of the pyramid have been cleaned out, leaving only the slimmest of clues as to what was originally placed there. One of the groups was on the exact center line of the structure and contained a feathered serpent baton, surely a signal of very high rank. This looting took place around AD 400 before long before the decline of the city and the fall of its government. In classic Teotihuacan architecture is based on a few simple principles. Interiors of small stones are faced with broken up volcanic stones set in clay and covered with a smooth coat of lime plaster. The typical architectural motif is that known as talu tablero. A rectangular panel with inset is placed over a sloping wall. Buildings from the humblest family shrine to large temples are decorated with this motif throughout the city. The panel area is often painted, and in the Temple of Quetzalcoatl, it serves as the support for elaborate sculptural decoration. Interestingly, the tablu tablero form itself seems to be an import from the Puebla Tlaxcala region, excuse me, but is used to such an extent by the Teotihuacanos that it becomes associated specifically with the metropolis. Most of what we see today at Teotihuacan was built after the completion of these three great public structures by the early 3rd century AD. By the early 4th century AD, it had reached the height of its population. Estimated by René Milon at a probable figure of 125,000, but possibly reaching 200,000 at its maximum. Palaces and Apartment Compounds A major finding of the Teotihuacan mapping project was that most of the city considered consisted of walled residential compounds divided internally into apartments. Most, if not all, apartment compounds were built after the completion of the monumental pyramids. We know little of how the already substantial population lived before the onset of apartment building. The few entrances to each compound suggest that the access was carefully controlled. 
Compounds measured from 4,300 to 75,000 square feet, although the majority fall near the middle of this range. The differences in construction, decoration, and room size indicate a rather large range of wealth and status. From analysis of excavated artifacts, it seems that the compounds were grouped into something like wards based upon kinship and or commercial interests. The city was cosmopolitan. In its western part there was a Oaxaca ward in which Zapotecs carried on their own customs and worshipped their own gods, while on the east there was one made up of people with strong connections to the lowland Veracruz and Maya areas. Typical of the compound layout might be Tetitla, a 60 by 60 meter square complex of several dozen rooms and nine apartment structures all are organized around courts. Each court was open to the sky, sometimes with a small altar in the center. Triadic temple arrangements found at Tetitla and throughout the classic city consist of a single raised platform containing the central temple joined to two flanking temples at 90 degree angles. This form is found already at late pre-classic Tentipa Puebla, as well as the earliest occupations at Teotihuacan. While windows were lacking, several of the rooms had smaller sunken courts, very much like the Roman atria, in which light and air were admitted through the roof, supported by the surrounding piers. The rainwater in the sunken basins could be drained off when desired. All compounds now were one-storied affairs, with flat roofs built from beans and small sticks and twigs, overlain by earth and rubble. Doorways were rectangular and covered by a cloth. It is estimated that the Tetitla compound would have housed 60 to 100 people. Each Teotihuacan compound must have been a rather tightly organized social group, given the specialization and planning essential to compound life. Males in the compound seem to have been more closely related to each other than the females. Most compounds had one or two rich burials, suggesting that the founders or important family members were especially honored. The sophistication and artistry of the Teotihuacanos can be seen in the magnificent murals, almost all of religious content, which adorn the walls of the palaces and apartment compounds. Many of these are highly repetitive, with rows of human figures whose bodies disappear under the elaborate description of their ritual att attire. In the porticos, one of the buildings in the white patio at at the Telco are depicted of processions of jaguars and coyotes, painted in various shades of red, and perhaps symbolizing the knightly orders of this warlike society. The larger and more richly decorated residences mainly found grouped around the Avenue of the Dead were surely the residences of the lords of the city. These qualify as true palaces in that they are significantly finer than the great majority of the other 2,000 compounds found throughout the city. The most famous of the compound murals are those at Tepantitla. Following their discovery, these were interpreted by Alfonso Caso as a depiction of the paradise of the rain god, or to use the Nahua term, Tlalocan. But the, but the deity domina dominating the scene, once thought to be Tlaloc himself, is now universally accepted as a female, following the work of Esther Pastore and others. Carl Tabi of the University of California, Riverside, has further shown that this goddess has the mouthparts, fangs, and pups of a spider. In Tabe's view, the Teotihuacan spider woman, as he calls this great goddess, was responsible for the creation of the present universe, and was the supreme deity of the Teotihuacanos. Very often in Teotihuacan, art and other individuals were, associate, were items associated with the goddess thereby associating themselves with her power. For reasons yet unexplained, she bears a close relationship, if not identity, with the spider grandmother who plays such an important role in Pueblo and Navajo creation mythology in the American Southwest, as well as with the spider woman goddess of the Koji of Colombia. While other Mesoamerican urban cultures certainly had female deities, few if any gave a female deity such a central role. In this vein, the landscape accompanying the spider woman in the Tepantitla murals would depict a place or places in the origin myth of the Teotihuacano people themselves, including a magic mountain with gushing springs at its base, perhaps the, C the Cerro Gordo, which looms to the north of the city, 
near which little human figures sing, conduct rituals, and play games. Butterflies and flowering trees added to the general gaiety of the scene. Few if any of these palaces are of sufficient size to have been the abode of the supreme rulers of the city. Some years ago, the late Pedro Armilas suggested that the Ciudad de la, a huge square enclosure with size of over 1,300 feet long near the center of the city, was the royal palace itself. Recent investigations have, in fact, revealed two apartment complexes, one in the northern half of the enclosure and one in the southern, which probably were seats of royal authority. As we have seen, the adjoining temple of Quetzalcoatl carries the imagery of creation and sacred war. If the Ciudad de la Complex really was the royal palace, then the ruling family may have identified itself with the center of the universe, the very beginning of time, and the sacred foundation of Teotihuacan's military might, a combination of ro royal legitimacy seen throughout Mesoamerica. If palaces alone had been built in ancient Teotihuacan, this would have been a peculiar sort of city. Some idea of the way more ordinary people lived is given by the compound called La Hinga 33 in the far south of the city, studied by Rebecca Story and Randolph Widmer. Although the general layout is comparable to the finer residences in the center, the builders used cheaper materials and did not decorate the residence with murals. Fairly humble artisans occupied this compound throughout its history and it seems that as time progressed, they became poorer and had less control over their crafts. There must have been an immense multitude of traders, artisans, and other non-food producers living in quarters of this sort. Mexico was to see nothing like this again until the Aztecs built their capital of Tenochtitlan, the Teotihuacan Pantheon. In Carl Tabi's view, as we have seen, the presiding deity of the Teotihuacan Pantheon was the Spider Woman, the patroness of our own world. Depicted, depictions of related female deities, or perhaps aspects of the goddess, include a colossal s statue representing the water goddess in Nahuatl, Chalchiotique, her skirt is of jade, an even larger statue weighing almost 200 metric tons and now in front of the Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City, was found in an unfinished state on the slopes of Tlaloc Mountain. It is identified in the popular Mexican consciousness with that deity, but wears abstracted versions of the female garments seen on the water goddess. It is likely that these and other supernatural females formed a closely related deity complex, much like the female deities of the Aztec. Many of the other gods of the complete Mexican pantheon are already clearly recognizable at Teotihuacan. Here we worship the the rain god or Tlaloc to the Aztecs, and the feathered serpent, the later Quetzalcoatl, as well as the sun god, the moon goddess, and Xipetotec, Nahuatl for our lord the flayed one. The the last name being the symbol of the annual renewal of vegetation with the onset of the rainy season. Particularly common are the incense burners of the old fire god, a creator divinity, and the probable consort of the spider woman. At any rate. It should be noted that almost all the gods venerated this great urban capital were intimately connected with the well-being of maize with their staff of life. Tradition holds that Teotihuacan was a sacred burial ground. Really important tombs have seemingly been discovered only by professional treasure hunters, but underneath the floors of the palaces and apartment buildings have been encountered a number of slab-lined graves and simple pit burials. The Teotihuacanos, like the later Aztecs, favored cremation of the dead, the body first being wrapped in a bundle. Around the remains were placed fine offerings of all sorts, particularly lovely and graceful vases, obsidian artifacts, and perishable things like textiles. Beliefs about the hereafter are recorded in a, in a Nahua song. And they called it Teotihuacan because it was the place where the lords were buried. Thus, they said, when we die, truly we die not, because we will live, we will rise. We will continue living, we will awaken. This will make us happy. Thus the dead one was directed when he died. Awaken, already the sky is rosy. Already sing the flame-covered guans, the fire-covered swallows. Already the butterflies fly. Thus the old one said, 
that who had died has become a god. They said, he has been made a god there, meaning he has died. Arts, Crafts, and Trade The Teotihuacan art style, as revealed in frescoes, sculpture, pottery, and other productions, could be tremendously elegant and refined, as well as highly stylized and ordered. Even when the artisans were less careful, there was a grave, minimal quality to the art, and the best work is monumental and still, no matter its size. Sculpture is best represented in the austere stone masks, fashioned from greenstone, basalt, jade, andesite, and other materials, each of which once had inlaid eyes of mussel shells or obsidian, as well as in a few very large-scale pieces such as the water goddess. Frescoes filled the walls of many of the more opulent apartment compounds, where they were applied in true fresco, with the diluted pigments applied to a fresh coat of lime plaster. Often a silicate such as mica was added to the pigment dil dilution to increase the, the paint's sheen, and after drying the whole was carefully burnished. The hallmark of Teotihuacan culture is the cylindrical pottery vase with three slab-shaped feet. Adapted in the 4th century AD, perhaps from earlier experiments on the Gulf Coast, this ceramic form became associated specifically with the metropolis. These vases or vases usually have fitted lids on top with handles in the form of a bird. Other characteristic forms in clay include vessels shaped like flower vases. Decoration on these luxury items, found in graves and far away as trade pieces, may be plano relief or painted on a thin coating of lime, the latter executed in the same manner as the wall frescoes. A fine ware known as thin orange was manufactured in southern Puebla, an, an area that may have been under Teotihuacan control, and appears as bowls with, annu with annular bases, boxes with lids, or effigies of l little dogs. Other objects of clay include large polychromed incense burners, built up of mold-made details, mold-made figurines of men and gods, and little two-hold candeleros, which might have been used to burn incense and contain the blood offered to the gods in an act of self-sacrifice. Clay pellets were carefully shaped for employment as blowgun missiles, and we know from a scene on a vase that this weapon was used in hunting birds. Obsidian chipping reached new heights of elaboration with the production of spear and dart points as well as little human effigies of that material. As usual, vast quantities of razor-like blades of obsidian are present. The Teotihuacan state controlled the great deposits of green obsidian near Pachuca, Hidalgo, and the 100 obsidian workshops known to have existed in the city were part of the thriving mercantile sector. Bone needles and bodkins testify to the manufacture of clothing and basketry, and we have charred remains of cotton cloth with weft pattern, coiled baskets, and twilted sleeping mats or petates. Paintings show that men wore a loincloth and or kilt with sandals, and women the pullover Pili and underskirt. Although none have survived, books must have been in both ritual and administrative use, for if these people had writing, if only of a rudimentary sort. Teotihuacanos knew of the complex Maya writing system, but chose to limit their own writing mainly to dates, names, or locations accompanying an image. An exception is the fascinating glyphic patio found in the La Ventilla area, where clear Maya and Teotihuacan signs filled the floor in a regular grid pattern. Cooking was done in kitchen areas with the compounds over clay, three-bronged three braziers, or three-pronged braziers. Charred vegetal materials and animal bones give some idea of the citizens' diet. They subsisted on small cob maize, common and runner beans, squashes and pumpkins, husk tomatoes, prickly pear cactus, avocados, and amaranth, along with wild plant foods. The important food animals were deer, dogs, cottontail rabbits and jackrabbits, turkeys, wild ducks and geese, and small fish. Much ink has been spilled over the problem of the agricultural base of Teotihuacan civilization. William Sanders is certain that there was a local irrigation system in the valley itself. On the other hand, there is some evidence of chinampa or floating garden cultivation, for relic chinampa plots show up on the Milan map of the city, and it is suggested that the well-known chinampa systems in the southern part of the valley of Mexico, such as the one at Xochimilco, 
have the same orientation as Teotihuacan itself. Yet it may be fruitless to look at the valley of Teotihuacan al alone for the secret of the capital's re remarkable success. For the city that we have described held sway over most of the central highlands of Mexico during the Classic and wielded significant influence over much of Mesoamerica. Like the later Aztec state, it may have depended as much on long-distance trade and tribute as upon local agricultural production. Elegant vases of pure Teotihuacan manufacture or showing pronounced Teotihuacan influenced are found in the burials of nobles all over Mexico at this time, and the art of the Teotihuacanos catalyzed to some extent the styles of the other high civilizations of Mesoamerica. Especially interesting is the contact with the Maya on the other side of Mesoamerica, some 650 miles to the southeast in the highlands of Guatemala on the outskirts of the modern capital of that republic, a little city has been found that is in all respects a miniature copy of Teotihuacan. The tombs of the chiefs of this center, Caminal Juyu, are full of luxuries imitating those from Teotihuacan itself, while some pieces were imported directly from the metropolis. A similar situation has been found at that colossus of Maya centers, Tikal, situated in the lowland jungle of northern Guatemala, where an early classic monument, st or st st known as Stella 31 rather, shows a jade bedecked ruler flanked by two views of his father garbed as a Teotihuacan warrior. Maya imagery and writing coexists with clear Teotihuacan symbolism on this and many other Tikal monuments and objects after the arrival of a Teotihuacan related group in the late 4th century AD. Soon after the arrival of Teotihuacanos at Tikal, a kingdom was founded at Copan, near the border of Guatemala and, and Honduras that was also based on the use of legitimating Teotihuacano symbolism. In all these contact scenarios, Teotihuacan's donation is quickly folded into the local culture and made to signal, to signal the power of the local lords. The presence of Teotihuacan in an already complex Maya political landscape has yet to be fully understood, and only further work will help us solve this complex historical puzzle. What is certain is that the rulers of the great classic cultures throughout Mesoamerica had a special reverence for the metropolis. The Rise and Fall of a City The question is, and it must be admitted that no definite answer can be given, who were the people of Teotihuacan? Who built this city and whence did they come? The early Spanish historian Torquemada tells us that the Totonac claimed the honor, and in this light, it is true that a few of the earliest classic Teotihuacan buildings show a certain decorative influence from Veracruz, the, to the, to the Totonac homeland. But there is little evidence that the Totonac were in Veracruz until much later, during the Epiclassic period. Some scholars claim an Otomi occupation of the city, others hold for the Popoloca. In view of the strong continuities between Teotihuacan on the one hand and the Toltecs and the Aztecs on the other, in both sacred and secular features, the Nahua affinities of the civilization would appear to be the most probable. On this question we are little wiser than were the native peoples, who thought that Teotihuacan had been built by giants or gods. The city met its end in the 7th century through deliberate destruction and burning by the hand of unknown invaders. It was mainly the heart of the city that suffered the torch, especially the palaces and temples on each side of the Avenue of the Dead, from the Pyramid of the Mood to the Ciudadela. Some internal crisis or long-term political and economic malaise, perhaps the disruption of its trade and tribute routes by a new polity such as the rising Xochichalco state, may have resulted in the downfall, and it may be significant that by AD 600 almost all Teotihuacan influence over the rest of Mesoamerica ceases. Along with political and economic factors, stress on the physical environments could have played a role in the decline of the metropolis. George Vaillant proposed that the destruction of the surrounding forests necessary for the burning of the lime that went into the building of Teotihuacan resulted in a precocious erosion and desiccation of the region. A related factor might have been the increasing aridity, ar aridity excuse me, of the climate all over Mexico during the Classic, which apparently was severest in the Valley of Mexico. The whole edifice of the Teotihuacan state may have perished through the ensuing agricultural debacle, opening civilized Mexico to peoples from the northern frontier. Whatever the causes, the luxurious palaces of Teotihuacan were now in ruins and its major temples abandoned. 
But away from the avenue of the dead, the city continued to live for another two centuries. This reduced occupation is called Coyotlatelco, from the simple red on buff pottery characteristic of the pyramid. Through a probable combination of people leaving, a natural decrease due to high infant and child mortality, the population of Teotihuacan had sunk to only a quarter of its former total. Azcapotzalco, a Teotihuacan-related center west of the Great Lake, futilely carried on an epigonal version of their old culture, the Great Pyramid of Cholula. As present-day travelers leave the valley of Mexico and journey east-southeast across the mountains rimming the basin, they eventually drop down on the pl- onto the plains of Puebla, the volcanic peaks of Iztaccíhuatl and Popocatépetl rising on the right hand. Once on the planets itself, they see before them shining in the sun yellow and green tile domes of a colonial period church that seems to rest on a very large hill. It comes as a shock to realize that this is not a hill at all, but a man-made pyramid, that of Cholula, one of the largest ancient structures in the New World. The Great Pyramid, which was already in ruins when the Spaniards first arrived, is actually the result of four successive superpositions, the first two of which are classic in date. The earliest pyramid exhibits the talud tablero motif characteristic of the Puebla region and later of Teotihuacan, and is painted with insect-like designs in pure classic Teotihuacan style. It was built at roughly the same time as the Great Pyramids of Teotihuacan. The second Great Pyramid, built directly over the first, no longer imitated local or Teotihuacan architectural forms. Here, the architects created a radial pyramid, 590 feet on a side, with stairs covering all four sides so that the summit could be approached from any direction. A 165-foot long polychrome mural with life-size human figures has been discovered at Cholula and is said to be classic in date, known as the, the Drunkards. The scene is indubitably one of drinking and inebriation, but the liquid imbibed could have been a hallucinogenic potion derived from the powerful mushrooms of ancient Mexico, or even from peyote rather than alcohol. Cerro de la Mesas Down on the Gulf Coast Plain, new civilizations appeared in the early classic that in some respects reflect continuity from the old Omex tradition of the lowlands, as well as intrusive elements ultimately derived from Teotihuacan. The site of Cerro de las Mesas lies in the middle of the former Omex territory, in south-central Veracruz, approximately 50 miles from the Bay of Alvarado, on a broad band of high land above the swamps of the Rio Blanco. The site is the center of an area dotted with earthen mounds. Cerro de las Mesas was occupied from middle pre-classic to the late post-classic times, but attained its apogee during the classic. A number of stella were encountered there by, st- by Sterling. Shows features recalling both the Olmec and the Sapan styles. On one side of each monument is generally carved in low relief so as to depict a high a hierarchically posed personage in rich attire in profile with one leg stiffly outstretched before the other. The Olmec wear jaguar appears in mask-like headdresses and on half masks which are occasionally worn over the lower face. Two of the monuments record long count dates, one being 9112 1410 AD 468 and the other 94 18 16 8 AD 533, well within the classic pyramid. Period, excuse me. Other sculptures include a monstrous figure of a duck-billed human closely resembled the Tushla statuette which itself was found not very far, far from Cerro de las Mesas. Excavations at the site brought to light a fantastically rich cache of carved jade, although there were 782 pieces from several areas of Mesoamerica buried together at some time during the, the Classic. While some are very much of the period, especially those of the lo- local styles of the Maya Highlands and of Oaxaca, a good number are purely Olmec, obviously heirlooms handed down from the ancient civilization that had once controlled this region. Was this cash left by some trafficker in fine jewelry? Does it represent the hoard of some local prince? Or, most plausible of all, 
Is this an offering to the unknown gods of Cerro de las Mesas? The classic Veracruz civilization. A large number of fine stone objects found on the Gulf Coast Plain are carved in a very distinct style that has been known as classic Veracruz. The majority of them are from the northern and central parts of that state, a zone in which are located several great elite centers that shared in the same art tradition. This style can be mistaken for no other in Mexico. On the contrary, its closest affinities seem to lie, for no ap apparent reason, across the Pacific with the Bronze and Iron Age cultures of China. It is a style in which all subject matter is secondary and bound to a complex ornamental motif, one of linked or intertwined scrolls with raised edges, perhaps the offspring of the cloud scrolls of the Isapan style. The classic Veracruz style commonly appears on a complex of enigmatic stone objects, the so-called yokes, palmas and hachas, axes or thin stone heads. Modern research has shown that all three are associated with the ritual ball game, as bas reliefs and figurines depict them being worn in that connection. The yokes, which are U-shaped and often intricately carved to represent stylized toads covered with convoluted scrolls and human faces, were stone replicas of the heavy protective belts worn by the players. They are found in the beginning in the late pre-classics in central Veracruz and continue to be made through the epiclassic. As the sculptural tradition became more complex, the front of the ceremonial belt could be fitted with a palma, an elongated sculpture adapted for that purpose. Palmas are often effigies of birds like turkeys, or are carved with realistic scenes. Their style is associated with the late phases of the classic Veracruz style, and several may be associated specifically with El Tajin, the epiclassic culmination of this tradition. The thin stone heads probably were markers placed in the court to score the game, but they too could be worn on the oak. In its formative phase, the style can best be seen in slate backs for circular mirrors of pyrite mosaic. These are certainly classic in date, as are many of the yokes. The tribal name Totonac has often been inappropriately applied to these carvings. While it is true that the Totonacs now occupied most of the zone in which such remains are found, it may or may not have been they who made them. Archaeologists prefer caution in these matters. Nevertheless, classic Veracruz influence is very perceptibly present in the beginnings of classic Teotihuacan, and some are inclined to accept Torquemada's statement that these people built the city. On the other hand, reciprocal influence from the highlands is also present here on the Gulf Coast. Classic Monte Alban The civilization of Monte Alban in the valley of Oaxaca during classic times was certainly the product of Zapotecan-speaking peoples. The changeover from the late pre-classic appears to have been peaceful, with some new elements in the proto-classic Monte Alban II coming up from the Maya area as kind of a burial cult. Pots, stands, painted stucco, decoration of pottery, and so forth. But the Maya influence stops with the commencement of the classic proper, and a new series of cultural elements holds sway with a particularly strong influence being exerted by Teotihuacan. There is no reason to think, however, of any major shift in population or of outside invasion. Furthermore, Oaxaca was sufficiently isolated to avoid some of the troubles visited upon Teotihuacan during the Classic period. Left to themselves to populate their own territory, the Zapotecs built site after site throughout the valley of Oaxaca, ruling the entire territory from the summit of Monte Alban. The slopes of the hill on which classic Monte Alban stands are covered with hundreds of residential terraces containing an estimated population of 25,000 at its apogee. A small number of strategically placed centers throughout the valley were only slightly less populous than the capital, but the great majority of the over 1,000 valley settlements were significantly smaller. Most of the valley's inhabitants were farmers, irrigating the rich bottomlands for their crops, but they must have also farmed the Piedmont zone above the valley. The classic site as it now stands was developed around a very large and long plaza. Bigger constructions were raised on rock nuclei that remained after the hill was leveled off. Among the buildings of this epoch are stone-faced platforms fronted by stairways with, with flanking balustrades. Something like the Talud Tablero architecture of Teotihuacan is evident, but the panel is modified from its original form. These and other buildings were once completely stuccoed. Some were given additional painted decoration. 
also present is a magnificent masonry ball court with a ground plan like a capital I, a form that was replicated at other important valley centers, leading researchers to posit an official game that may have helped sort out conflicts among groups. Even more indicative of Monte Alban culture was the building form known as the Temple Patio Altar Complex, which is found on the summit in systems M and IV, as well as on hilltops throughout the valley where Monte Alban held sway. Subterranean tombs, 170 of them, have been discovered all over the site, some of which were of great magnificence, magnificence excuse me, testimony to the wealth of the lords of Monte Alban. The best are quite elaborate chambers, often with a corbelled vault, and have an antechamber. Fine murals were painted on the plastered walls. Tomb 104, in the northern part of the site, is certainly the most spectacular known thus far. Over the facade of the tomb is a niche with a pottery urn representing a person wearing the headdress of the rain god. The door was a single great slab covered with hieroglyphs. Within the funerary chamber, the skeleton was stretched out on the floor, surrounded by rich offerings including more clay urns. Lovely murals grace the walls, depicting a procession of figures with elaborate ritual dress advancing towards the rear of the tomb, interspaced with glyphs. While the organization of these tombs is typically Zapotec, the styles of these and other classic Monte Alban frescoes, down to the smallest details of such as the treatment of the feather ornamentation, is obviously derivative from Teotihuacan. Monte Alban had an enclave in Teotihuacan where they maintained Zapotec burial customs and scribal traditions, while at the same time cultivating an intimate relation to the techniques and traditions of the, of the Teotihuacan. A large number of urn figures may be identified as representations of deified ancestors through their use of names called from the sacred calendar. These were usually found in tombs, but could also be used as offerings placed in temples. This cult of deified ancestors was central to classic Monte Alban culture and accounts for the enormous amount of artistic capital spent shaping and decorating the numerous tombs. Tombs were re-entered time and time again during the classic to place additional burials, or even to substitute new ones for old, with new paintings being applied over the old. Thus, some of these murals, like those in Tomb 105 at Monte Alban, are, are virtually palimpsests. Some, at least in the gods of Monte Alban, are shared with other Mexican peoples and can thus be identified. Their divinity finds abundant expression in the large numbers of the pottery urns placed with the dead, often in groups. In these, the use of mold is rare, much of the ornamentation being built up by sharply carved clay strips. Each god is generally seated, cross-legged, richly dressed with an elaborate headdress containing the symbol by which he is known. We have in an old dictionary the Zapotec names of some of these deities. The most important members of the pantheon were the lightning god, Cosillo, the maize god, Pitao Kosobi, often adorned with actual casts of maize ears, the feather serpent, a bat god, the old fire god, and possibly the water goddess. The writing and calendric system of the classic Monte Alban was fully developed from the pre-classic base. Although there are no surviving codices, glyphs appear everywhere, both in sculpted relief on the funerary urns and painted on, on walls at the principal site itself and at other Monte Alban centers. The enumeration continues to be in the bar and dot system. Inscriptions typically open with a date in the 52-year calendar round. This is given by a year bearer, as Alfonso Caso and Javier Ursid had demonstrated. The year was named by one of four days in the 260-day count on which it could begin or end, along with the numerical coefficient of that year and a year bearer sign in the form of a royal headband. These year bearer days were the, were the second, seventh, twelfth, and seventeenth positions within the list of twenty named days. Unfortunately for Mesoamericanists, the Zapotecs never adopted the lowland long count, so that inscribed dates cannot be fixed with an absolute chronology. Another complicating factor, as Ursid has indicated, is that most Zapotec monuments have been reused and often moved from their original positions with the result that texts which once made sense in the context of neighboring inscriptions no longer do so. And lastly, 
it now appears that many notations in the 260-day count, long interpreted as having chronological significance, are in reality the calendrical names of historical personages. What kind of script is this? From its origins in the Monte Alban I per period through the Classic and Epiclassic periods, there were always about 60 to 80 non-calendrical glyphs. This is far too high for a purely phonetic syllabary or alphabet, but within the range for known scripts of the logosyllabic sort, one in which there is a mixture of logographic or semantic and syllabic or, phon or phonetic signs. Thus far, it remains one of the very few undeciphered writing systems of the world, but, but progress in cracking it may be rapid once the proto sapotec language has been reconstructed by linguists, and, and also once the corpus of all Sapotec inscriptions, now being compiled by Javier Urseed, reaches completion. While there are no signs of a, conf of a conflagration, as at Teotihuacan, sometime before 800 AD, the capital was largely abandoned and Monte Alban fell into ruins, as did many, but not all, regional centers in, in the valley. Later, peoples like the Mixtecs used the old Zapotec sites as kind of a consecrated ground for their tombs, some of them, as we shall see, quite wonderful, perhaps in an attempt to establish their continuity with the native dynasties that have ruled here for over a thousand years. The Classic Downfall The single most important fact that archaeologists have learned about the Classic period in Mexico is the supremacy of Teotihuacan, its impress being clearly recorded throughout this incredibly varied country and beyond to other parts of Mesoamerica. As the urbanized center of Mexico with high population and tremendous pr production, its power was imposed through a political and cultural means not only in its native highland habitat, but also along the tropical coasts, reaching even into the Maya area. That this was a trading and tribute empire entirely comparable with the Aztec cannot be doubted. All other states were partly or entirely dependent upon it for whatever achievements they attained at this time, and any solution of the problem of why the classic developed at all must be approached through the more central problem that Teotihuacan, without local antecedents, presents to puzzled archaeologists. Perhaps agricultural collapse also had something to do with the classic debacle, with the weary farmers of Mexico no longer willing to build pyramids and, pl and palaces for leaders who failed to provide the rains that would guarantee them full harvests. Also, destabilizing were the internal pressures created by disaffected nobles. It is as if the pattern of Mesoamerican life, established with the first civilizations of the pre-classic, had become exhausted. In short, the country was ripe for revolution as well as conquest from outside, and the two forces probably together produce the different way of life that we see in later periods. This concludes chapter 6.